Good morning. Welcome to episode 16 with Security Matters with the Coffee Squad. How you doing, Jake? Good, Will. How you doing? I'm doing good. So today's episode, we're going to be talking about due diligence and kind of how to research, conduct your research prior to purchasing or, or selecting a service, right? Homework. So, homework. homework. Yep, there you Which go. Which I sucked at. Your I, don't, I don't know how good you were doing your homework as a kid, but uh, whenever the teachers called my house, it was Jake didn't do his homework. So um, how good were you at doing your homework? I, it didn't really, wasn't a thing for me until I got to college. And then I kind of, uh, yeah, it caught up to me because in high school I, I would get in trouble for not doing my homework, but I had good enough grades on my tests and stuff that it didn't really matter. Okay. So I never really learned how to study. And then when I got into a real university, it kicked me in the butt. <laughs> I, I struggled. Yeah. So my grades were always fine. I was like, yeah, I didn't really study. Um, but yeah, once, uh, it was really when I started my master's program that I was like, oh, crap, I'm in trouble. I actually have to read. I actually have to write papers. Um, so uh, I won't air all my dirty little secrets. Uh, some university out there may revoke a diploma. But, yeah, <laughs> I wasn't I wasn't the best student always. So uh, I've learned uh, mainly, I guess, through the military, really how to, how to be a better student, which is Definitely. a little crazy, you know. Um, so cool. So, yeah, so due diligence and then, uh, yeah. Keep talking, man. I'm sorry to interrupt you. Oh, you good. So we're going to, uh, just for the, our first timers or people who haven't been with us in a while, we're going to talk about what we're drinking today, today, and then we'll go with a question or two of the week, then an article of two of the week. Then we're going to talk about the topic. So this morning, what are you drinking? What kind of fancy lime wedge cucumber water are you drinking? So, you know, I always have my trusty water here, um, that Nalgene bottle, and I... Uh, I always like a little bubbly, right? So I have this LaCroix uh, sparkling you like the way berry. the bubbles feel on your nose? I do. I do. Especially, especially if it goes down, you know? It's so good when it hits your lips. Uh, so I have this berry-flavored LaCroix, um, which is pretty good. I haven't had that one. So, uh, I don't think I've had that one either. Yeah, it, it, it's not bad. So what are you drinking? Well, I have my uh, Black Rifle Comp. Black Rifle Coffee Company, just black coffee roast, which is a medium roast, uh, hints of vanilla and a little bit of cocoa on it. And then I also got a uh, sparkling water. It's a lime flavored LaCroix. So I'm rubbing off on you, man. Watch yeah. out. So, yeah, I mean, funny, right? We call ourselves a coffee squad. I know you and Ray drink coffee. You drink the fancy stuff. Ray drinks the stuff, you know, out of a gas can uh, at the gas station. Uh, and then I don't drink coffee. So, uh, a little interesting. I always find it interesting every week. You know, you have some fancy, fufui, uh, awesome little coffee. I think you're part of like the the America Coffee Association or Tasters <laughs> Association. No. Uh, I know we were talking about it a little bit uh, over the phone the other day about the uh, Coffee Association of America and their different flavor categories. They have like a hundred of them. Um, so if you are a listener and you love coffee, uh, Google. I think it's the uh, coffee association of america and they have this little taster wheel different colors uh pretty interesting so i think will hits on one or two or three or four different flavors uh every week so interesting i'm glad you're drinking some black rifle coffee uh great company i think they have the best social media ads out there oh absolutely, uh, yeah you know it's great you know seeing a veteran company um do so well um and support other veterans and other great causes you know, like the blue that whole coffee. platform, you know, they're all, they like support each other, Black Rifle and then uh, Lead Slingers, you know, they're all kind of tied in together. It's really good. So I don't yeah. understand how you can be almost a career soldier. You've been, you were in for what, 12, 15 years, something like that. Uh, 14, yep. 14, okay. And you don't drink coffee. Ray, lifetime soldier, that's why he drinks the, uh, the swill, right? Yep. I, I learned, you know, I grew up on the west side of, of the country and during the coffee boom, which is another thing you're from the west coast and you don't drink coffee. It's just California, coffee man. Like uh, when Starbucks and everything was, you know, becoming big and popular before them. And like uh, I grew up in the valley there, the Sacramento area. So we had a place called Java City and that was like the big thing in high school. Uh, everyone would show up with their drinks. Honestly, I tried it. Uh, I just thought it tasted bitter. I'm also not a beer drinker, you know, two things that you love that I absolutely cannot <laughs> yeah. stand. So um yeah a little different uh i would always yeah i was kind of the different uh the soldier i also didn't dip either so um a little bit of an anomaly out there you like the uh fruity drinks like the fuzzy navels man <laughs> you put an umbrella in that thing it's gone there you go. so 
So yeah, um, awesome, awesome. So you know, uh, a lot every week it seems like you know we're talking about some interesting news articles and what's going on. Um, you know, to me, the world's a fascinating place. You know, all the geopolitical stuff, you know, around the globe, ha- everything happening with our within our country. But um, for our listeners out there, you, I don't know if they heard, didn't hear. You know, North Korea blew up the inner liaison office on the North Korea South Korea border the other day. Um, you know, what, what are your thoughts? You know, what's North Korea trying to, trying to achieve in this? And did I just I say, think, you know, like 10 different times right there? I think so. I think, I think you're trying to make sure that we know what you're talking about. You know, um, I think that North Korea is trying to flex their muscle, you know, <laughs> you know, so, but you know, everybody in, in the world is dealing with this pandemic. And so I think one of the things they're trying to do is kind of flex their muscle to see how much, if any, the U.S. especially, since we're the ones who kind of keep them in check, and other countries are kind of going to react to them kind of flexing their muscle. And I also think they're using it as a distraction from how they're reacting to the COVID because they are having a hard time like most countries. But because of the sanctions and other things that are going on, they're, you know, they're in a famine for the most part. They don't get the imports mm-hmm. like most other countries do. And so not only are they starving and now they're dying of COVID. So if it gets out how dire the situation really is, I think that they'd get a lot more scrutiny. So I think this is just another way to cause diversion from what's really going on behind the curtain. Yeah. I, th- I think there's a diversion tactic there. Uh, I think COVID, pl- I mean, I don't know. I mean, no one truly knows the answer as to why, except for the leadership of the Communist Party there in North Korea. So everything else is a guess or an educated guess as to why they're they're acting like a little two-year-old throwing a little temper tantrum right now. Uh, I I agree with what you're saying. I, I, I Politically and economically, they're being crushed. You know, the people can't really speak out because, you know, they will – go to some type of prison reform uh, type of camp there. I also, Kim Jong-un's sister, hey, Kim Jong-un has been rumored, you know, there was a rumor about a month and a half ago that he was dead. People hadn't seen him for a long time. Uh, Then it came out that he was hiding out, or not hiding out, but he was at his little vacation spot up on the coast. So his sister was kind of filling that role, and she's been slowly making that role in leadership. Um, North Korea is predominantly a male ran militaristic government. Um, So having a female and a young female, she's in her thirties, I believe early thirties is different. You know, her grandfather was the founder of the communist party in North Korea. Now then her father and now her brother is in charge. So I think she's starting to make a stand. Uh, and I think her brother, Kim Jong-un, is allowing her to take a stand and be more vocal out about the country. So if he, his health condition is, is, isn't is the best for, you know, he's our age, a little bit younger. Uh, but, he, you know, he's already had heart surgery, some heart troubles and other issues. If he does contract COVID, it could be the end of him. So I think COVID plays a part. And I think his sister trying to not assume power, but fill that power vacuum if he does die to show the military leadership that she's not to be messed with. She's strong and she can lead the country. So, you know, she's been outspoken with South Korea, with the U.S., you know, when they blew up the uh, the building there. So I, I think that's the biggest thing. I also think, you know, financially, they're, they're not getting what they want. You know, they want Trump to come to the table and allow him to do, you know, be a, a nuclear power um and so i think the trump administration has every administration has, has continued and put sanctions on him but i think he's kind of tightened tightened the nooses on him a little bit i also think you know it's a collection uh collection and an election year here in the u.s so we are if i was a foreign adversary of the united states and trump was a president if i was an iranian leader a venezuelan leader or a north korean leader I would do whatever I could to make him look weak or that he is causing turmoil in the United States. So I think there's a variety of, of reasons why they're, why they're acting out. So uh, it's definitely interesting. Right. And so I think, yeah. you know, good- talking about this, uh, this was also part of my news article of the week, but, and how it ties into due diligence. Right. And so, 
you know, consulting for companies, global companies right now and what we do, you know, one thing I definitely recommend is, hey, don't travel to South Korea right now if you can avoid it and don't travel to Japan. You know, and everyone's like, well, why Japan? Well, because when they fire a missile over the Sea of Japan, there's an inadvertent risk of hitting a commercial airliner, just like Iran did shortly after when General Khomeini, and I'll never say that guy's name right, uh, when he was killed in Iraq, you know, a few days later, Iran launched some rockets and some missiles and took down a civilian airliner. So um, do your due diligence, you know, when there's global events like this happening around the world, do your homework, study up, find out. You know, where should I travel? What range of rockets do they have? And is it a safe thing to do? So um, honestly, right now, pretty much all of Asia is kind of on the no fly area between India, China, South Korea, North Korea. I kind of stay out of that whole area right now. Personally. I mean, honestly, the State Department, if you go to the State Department website, again, due diligence, right? You're, you're yep. doing your homework. You're doing your research. Uh, you go to the State Department website, nearly all international travel yeah, is uh they're recommending it as being rad restricted so i uh, do not travel COVID, to yeah. due to covid um so uh, now if you're going to say we didn't have covid and you know if you're traveling to an iran or venezuela you know some other areas then the threat levels are always high so you know, again international travel look at the state department a great resource out there it's free yep. so uh, so Let's jump into a little news article of the week here. So mine was North Korea. We've already kind of skinned that cat a little bit. Uh, what do you got going on? So my first article is going to be um, there's a $2 million treasure hidden in the Rocky Mountains that has reportedly been found. So this guy like 10 years ago hid, uh, let me see, he buried the treasure in 2010, buried uh, a hidden treasure somewhere in the Rockies, right? And, you know, that's a pretty big mountain range. It goes from Canada all the way to Mexico, but he said it was somewhere in the United States, so Montana down to New Mexico. It's a lot of ground to cover. And he wrote a poem, and so that was the only clue you had. So I think they've estimated 350,000 people have tried to find this treasure over the years, and now finally somebody did on uh, June 6th. He, uh, some guy from back east found it. And they say it's over. It's worth probably around two hundred or two million dollars. Wow! So, so over ten years is a million dollar treasure that he buried, and just due to the commodities and I guess interest or inflation, whatever it was that he hid in there, uh, it nearly doubled. Do you know what the poem yeah. was? I it's you could probably find it somewhere. I uh, it wasn't like roses are red, violets are blue. I hid a treasure <laughs> chest just for you. No. Uh, Oh, so okay. like the last line was, it was under a canopy of stars in the lush forted vegetation of the Rocky Mountains. So, you know, I don't, I don't know. That that narrows it down. But apparently, a lot of people uh, search for it. I know one. He said somebody came close a few years back. But yeah, how do you know they came close? They contacted him and said, "Hey, yeah, you know, this is where I'm looking at. You know, people are always trying to get gotcha. more hints, more clues, and." He did tell somebody he's like you're clo- you're the closest anyone's ever been, but that's all he said. Wow. I mean, that, huh. I didn't know really if he had like down, so. game camera set up, you know, on solar panels and stuff like at the site, I, you know. I would inf- infer, right? Infer. Anyways, I would think that there was a note or something say, "Hey, once you you found it, you win. Please let me know so yeah. I can put it out there that it's no." How old was the gentleman? He is 89, so I guess he was 79 years old. And that was one of the things he said, you know, I can still walk out there and visit it. So it's not in an extremely dangerous place to hmm. get to. So, huh. yeah, crazy. You know, I mean, 89 years old is not a spring chicken. So, no. you know, um, I wonder, you know, especially with COVID going on, right? Um, and affecting the older the population. If he thought, man, you know, I may never, someone may never find this treasure. Or I may never know if anyone ever found this treasure. So how cool. What a what a cool thing, you know, and the guy who found it and everyone who did it, you know, talking about due diligence, right? So I'm sure they did their homework. They they researched, you know, tried to take things apart, you know, mm-hmm. looking at geo coordinates and everything else and you know, try to that find poem so. line by line. And, yeah. Yep. Yeah. How cool. Uh man, I didn't know about that. I wish I would. I think there was a whole blog or something, you know, a, like online group of people, excuse me, group of people that would talk about it and say, all right, this is where I believe it's at. Somebody was like, no, so-and-so has already been there, you know? So they kind of, he kind of narrowed it down from talking back and forth and, and stuff like that. So it was pretty cool. Interesting. I thought. Really? That, I mean, that's, I think it's super, super cool. So, uh, 
So this week, my little news article is, you know, we've been talking about COVID quite a bit. And look, COVID is, you know, China's having their second outbreak in Beijing right now. Um, who knows how many outbreaks really, um, because it is China. And we've already discussed that in another uh, podcast. But uh, pretty interesting. The uh, A university right outside of Paris has been looking at training dogs, specifically uh, Belgian Malinois, to sniff out COVID-19. Um, and they started with, I think it was less than 20 dogs. Um, and they were taking sweat from COVID-19 patients who had tested positive for it and putting them in jars and having the dogs sniff out the right, you know, I think they started off with three jars initially and one of the three jars had COVID. Then they went to seven and up and up and up. And the crazy part was that these dogs had, you know, a 95% rate or to a hundred percent rate of actually detecting COVID-19. So, so uh, was really interesting. Was- was it all from one person or was it from different people? I They didn't specifically say. They said they took it from different patients. So I'm mm-hmm. assuming that it was multiple patients. But again, I think it was an initial study. You know, you were a police officer uh, and in the military. In the military, we used canines for, you know, bomb detection, amongst other things. So uh, and you know, canines have been used to sniff out cancer and other stuff. So really interesting, really cool way. I know we talked, you know, last week about you know, returning to life and what that looks like with COVID as uh, more and more businesses are opening up. And we've talked about thermal cameras um, and thermal imaging and thermometers and everything else to get, you know, employees back or people in their restaurants or businesses. So, you know, here's an option that hopefully teases out in the next, however long it takes to, to get it out there of using canines to, you know, almost like I, I look at it as TSA of, yeah. Uh, when you're at some airports, you know, sometimes I'll have the TSA bomb sniffing dogs, drug sniffing dogs walk through before you go through the line um, and just smell you. Um, and everyone, you know, keeps their social distancing. So pretty interesting article on that. It is interesting. I'm surprised they use the Belgians. I mean, great dogs. I loved them on on patrol. But that to me would be a more of a passive alert type response. And Belgians have such a high drive and they're so aggressive that I would I would think that you use a different type of canine, like a, a lab or a bloodhound or something. But that's just, yeah. you know, based on yeah. my experience. So, um, yeah, I mean, I, and the look, right. So again, if, if this does end up happening um, and there's a lot of great canine companies here in the U S that do a lot of um, canine experimentation and support, you know, um, out where I live, uh, there's a canine company that had the Marine canine, uh, program for for years and now they use you know they spun off to, to companies and other stuff they're at sporting events and other stuff uh, but that's something they, they can look at you know and as a company you know if you are a chief security officer you're in charge of security of a, of a company and you're helping with this covid uh, issue it's something to look at you know research, research and look at some of these canine companies that are out there throughout the u.s um bell laws like you're saying like mallon laws uh, they are extremely expensive, you know? Oh, yeah. And so well, any, any of those trade dogs are going to be high no matter the time, but yeah. The Belgians. And, and then also the threat, you know, like, look, uh, when I see a, a mountain wall, I'm, I'm instantly thinking, you know, it's a bite dog. Cause that's really what yeah. we use them for is a, is a bomb sniffing and, and a bite dog. So um, I think that's a public's perception as well, because a lot of police units use them, you know, you can back at the height of the global war on terrorism, you know, you, you saw the dogs. So um, you know, again, uh, it's a thought and hopefully their the companies are, they're going to adapt, you know, to what the customer wants, but oh, yeah. the customer can also, you know, do their research on their canine companies of who's using them. You know, what's that canine company? What are their ratings? What have they done? What have they done in security in the past? You know, how successful are they, you know, in detecting COVID X amount of times. And then, you know, again, using a plan to use them. So, so pretty cool. So it's a good little segue, right? You know, we keep talking a bit about due diligence because, um, Due diligence is in everything we do, you know, right? We said earlier in the, in the podcast of it's, it's your homework, um, to break it down in the simplest of terms. It's, it's just doing your homework on anything you're going to invest in, you know, whether that's an emotional investment, a financial investment, you know, um, just, it's doing that research. Yeah. And so 
a quick definition that we found was due diligence is the investigation or exercise of care that a reasonable person or business is expected to take before entering into an agreement or contract with another party or an act with a certain standard of care. So essentially, if you, before you buy something or hire somebody, you should do your due diligence and, and it's essentially research homework, however you want to do it. And I think a lot of people are already doing it some form or another. And the word do or the term due diligence, I guess, is more from the military law enforcement Security realm. side, yeah. Yeah, but people are already doing it. And what we want to talk about today is just kind of highlight why you should be doing it and that you should be doing it, you know? Yeah. And so for our, I think our listeners who um, may kind of question, well, what do you mean I'm already doing it, right? Uh, a few examples, right? When you go to buy a home, if you're moving, you know, from one city to, to another for whatever of many of life's reasons, you are hopefully you're calling around about real estate agents. What's the best one to use? You know, what's the best company to use? Uh, and then you narrow that down and, and you look on there, you know, because of social, I said, you know, probably for our listeners out there, look, if you can count how many times I say, you know, I put it out there, we will send you uh, some swag. All right. So, um, so there you go. A challenge to our listeners out there. Um, but at, as you're doing that due diligence and you're researching it, the, the internet is such a great tool. Yeah. We, I'm sure you're as a police officer, you have to be able to weed through it, but yes, it's a great tool. It, it, when you got a call, what was that like? Did you do any due diligence before you, you showed up? Well, so, you know, I learned, worked in a fairly small agency. So most of the time I knew the history just based on being there. But when I first started, what I would do is I would call my partner or I would call the dispatch and say, Hey, you know, especially what kind of call is it? Oh, it's a domestic. Is this something that happens all the time? And they check their system and say, yeah, we've had six domestics in the last six months. You know, it's, it seems like every, at the end of every month when you get paid, they're out getting drunk and fighting. So, you know, it, it's a habitual thing. They've never had an issue with guns or, you know, they'll say, hey, there's a history of assault and law enforcement officer. You know, we get that information as we're going. Uh, same with, you know, if you get a tag or something like that, you know, you're running all that information, finding out who's driving it, who, who owns it, inf- you know, insurance, all that stuff. That's all you're trying to do as much as you can prior to getting there or having your contact so you're not going in blind because most contacts are blind essentially. Yeah. So investigations, right? I'm sure yep. you guys were using open source and some of the other resources that you had to, to research either victims or uh, the perpetrators who are committing those crimes. Yep. So, uh, you know, there's an example of, of using the police force in the military. I used it quite a bit being an intelligence guy on a special forces team. That's, uh, as, as being trained in the different types of intelligence, you know, the internet was, was one of the best tools we used it. Uh, we called them country studies in any country we were going to, whether it was permissive or non-permissive environment, permissive being, uh, with an agreement with, with a country and non-permissive being, uh, not always an agreement or, um, there was somewhat of a, call, there's semi-permissive too. Um, so using that intelligence to look at, we would go from, Airlines, trans, you know, transportation in general, hospitals, what are their ratings? You know, what trauma levels are they? Where are we staying? If it was a hotel, what's the hotel security look like? Um, the units we were going to, to interact with or train um, at different base locations, the, the politics of that country. So we used, of course, in the government, you have your classified and unclassified systems. Uh, a lot of it we found was really on the unclassified system mm-hmm. on the green side. Uh, so that is, was a great way uh, that we used. We did our due diligence prior to going into a country. Even if we've been into that country, I, multiple, multiple trips to Central and South America, same with over to Afghanistan. Even if I was going to the same place, things change. You know, whether right. it was, you know, six months in between a deployment and I was going back to the same place or similar place, things change. You know, characters change. Um, so looking at that information and digesting it and making those assessments and those educated decisions is really what due diligence is. And as so we like, look at, yeah. go ahead. 
So, so as I was a, on the SWAT team, I was SWAT team leader, and so whenever we would do a raid, we would essentially do that. So you'd get your public records, you get your blueprints, you get your your Google Maps to get an aerial view. We'd have human re- human intelligence going in doing drive by, getting pictures, maybe send an ice or undercover or an informant in to get a layout of the land, find out what kind of people are inside, what kind of uh, weapons, if any, are inside the layout. If there's any fortifications, any locks, escape routes, booby traps, anything like that. And so, you know, you go from there and then you kind of, I know you guys, especially in your world, you kind of go outside in where when we were doing raids and stuff like that, we went and worked our, as best we could inside out. We wanted to know what was inside. Okay. And then how we, now, once we know what's inside, how are we going to get in there and look at it that way? So that, and, and most of the time, because of the freedom of information act and stuff like that, most of that stuff is public records. You just have to know where to look it. Yeah, totally. I mean, so we, now on the corporate side, corporate security side, we do a lot of what's called these due diligence reports, right? Uh, and that can stem from looking at an individual, uh, whether it's a background check on someone you're going to hire or an individual that you're going to go into business with uh, and looking at that. So you're looking at residents, you know, past job performance, any social media uh, that they've been on, good and negative, Financial. any... Yeah, financial stuff, bankruptcies, uh, lawsuits, uh, and criminal records, professional licenses, um, cell phones, you know, everything, you know, what have they jumped from job to job or have they jumped from home to home? Or are they renters? Are they homeowners? You know, to try to give our clients the best picture of this individual, you know, if it's a business uh, dealing, you know, have they gone in and claimed bankruptcy numerous times? Uh, are they coming in to do a hostile takeover? Do they come in and they invest a lot of money and then they bring in some buddies from you know college that they went to um, and they've left a trail of doing this to several companies and they usually start out smaller and, and get bigger and bigger and do these hostile takeovers. So, uh, you know, that's on an individual basis. When you're doing a security assessment, we're doing our due diligence there. We're looking at, we're using our security analysts to, look at the crime statistics of the area, look at the leadership of the company, look at the, the scope and depth of the company, um, basically looking at every single factor we can to understand this company. And we don't just look at that company, we're also looking at their competitors. We do a lot in the, the chemical plastics uh, industry. So looking at who are their competitors, who sits on their board, and a lot of board members actually, uh, for some of these companies, are CEOs of, the, of their competitors. So you're you're looking at all the stuff you're looking at locations do they have their own separate headquarters building is that a shared office space you're looking at parking garages if it's a plant you know where their plants located uh, what are the politics in that area so uh you know we use due diligence in every single aspect of security we're looking at security guards you know I mean, let's look at Seattle right now and some of these other cities that are Chaz, um, Chop, whatever it is. Yeah, you know, uh, whatever crazy little wannabe government that they're setting up there. Businesses are either leaving or they're hiring security guard companies. I mean, when you are in a crisis, right, and we've talked about this time and time again of of plan, plan, plan. Uh, But you know, when you're when you're in a crisis and you need a security guard company, whether they're armed or unarmed. If you just, you know, Google them, you're going to get what you get, you know, and a lot of security guard companies, you know, the training that they receive, uh, whatever state it is, some are much better than others in North Carolina. It, it's very minimal. I think it's a, a week of training and I did might you, be very generous. Did you in see that, that one I sent training. you today? No. Did you see that what was it? So I sent you a security firm in the United States. I won't name them or anything, but like, but so their top three guys are talking about all this experience they have. And now one of them has ever had a job in security, but they're security experts. You know, they're talking about everything but security. And I just, you know, <coughs> come up from yeah. our experience, you know, we, years and years of working force protection, you know, intelligence, OSA, a human intelligence, whatever some form of security physical or cyber or whatever and then these guys are talking about nothing period security the only thing they ever mentioned what's crazy right so there's really like you know we break it down to uh, try to do things really simple and and easy way terms but when you look at security you have your physical security right your buildings or any Mm -hmm. walls 
anything like that, the environment. And then you have your human security. So people, you know, it's, and then you have your technical, that's your, your cyber, those are your machines. That's everything else. And so, heck, do your due diligence on companies, find out what their background is, how they get there, you know, what made them go that route? Uh, What are their reviews? Are they a small mom and pop company that like this company, you know, that just, hey, that man, they have a great advertising firm that can throw some flashy stuff on there and it looks great and cool and sexy. Yeah, the website but in reality great, are, but... they have, and they might be great business people, but zero experience in security. You know, what types of liabilities are you opening yourself up to you know, when it comes to security guards? Even, hey, security consultants, you know, we're a security consulting firm. You know, yeah. do your research. You know, what certifications do they have? Do they not have them? Why don't they have them? You know, there's, you know, uh, ASIS is a, you know, is kind of the, one of the global standards in physical security. Uh, so do they have those certificates um, or do they have a background that, you know, plays into it, you know, from former law enforcement, military, um, or were they a security guard, you know, and do they learn from the ground up uh, and create their own business? So uh, again, do your homework uh, when it comes to that time and money investment and anything you, you really do. Uh, we are a security podcast, so we're, we're going to drive it home on your on security. Let's talk about security alarm companies, right? Security systems, you know, is ADT better than your ring or your Simply Safe um, or another you know, company? Do your research. And then again, how does it fit to you? What are your assets? What are you trying to protect? You want to find out if day. it goes directly to police, if it goes to a call center, how that works out, what the response times are. I know, Jake, you have a really good response time at your place. Um, us, not so much. You know, for our business, we have panic alarms, and every once in a while, somebody will trip it on accident, and an hour later, if we're lucky, somebody will come in and say, uh, you guys set the alarm off? <laughs> uh, yeah. I guess so. But, I mean, you know, good thing nothing happened, right? So, And that's great to know, right? I mean, again, you – is it the security alarm's fault that it takes the sheriff or the police an hour to get there? No. It could be. It could be that they've sat and twiddled their thumbs and like, oh, this alarm's been going off be. for 20 minutes. Let me call the let me call the police and let them know. Um, I, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you, I use Simply Safe. Um, I live in a very, very secure neighborhood. Not to say that stuff and crime doesn't happen, but for North Carolina, we are in the top 10. Um, so I mainly bought my security alarm system to let me know when my little boys are going in and out. We have a pool uh, going in and out. Uh, When I do travel, my wife likes to set the alarm system. She forgets the code. I forget the code. And so the police have been out here twice and both times it's been about five minutes, but that's wonderful to know. You know, it takes an hour for for them to get to your place. It takes, you know, five minutes to get to mine. That means during that time, you're on your own. And people need to realize that, hey, because I have an alarm system, doesn't mean the cops are going to be there within a minute or two. Uh, it could take up to five minutes where I live, an hour where you live. And so that's, again, that's doing your due diligence of knowing what you're paying for, knowing what that response time is. Talk to your local police. Talk to your local sheriffs if you have an alarm system. Hey, what's your average response time to a call? Uh, yeah. Again, it's all public information. So, um, and, it, and it's easy. It's just, I think a lot of people, when they hear the term due diligence, they kind of, what what is it? It's homework. It's doing your own little investigation into anything that you want to do. Absolutely. Sorry. You yawning there? Am I putting you to sleep? No, I was like yawning slash coughing over there. Uh, so employees background checks, that's important too, you know, um, to do those. And every company, if they're not doing it, they should be doing it. Yeah, so background checks, you know, a lot of, uh, private investigation firms do them. Um, depending on the firm and how depth the de- in depth you want to go on that private investigative background check depends on how much it's going to cost. You know, some will run from twenty. They usually run between twenty five and sixty dollars, um, depending on how in depth. And some could even go more depending on the location and, and the city you live in. Right. So if you live in San Francisco, New York City it costs that private investigator a lot more to have his office and, you know, cost of living. Whereas here in North Carolina, it's a lot cheaper. So, uh, 
Well, even the difference but, between Fayetteville and Charlotte's a huge difference. So, yeah. yeah. So it's looking at those background checks and what do you want? Do you want to know criminal history? Do you want to know financial history? Do you want to know the whole thing? Do you want to look at, you know, one thing that we do with our due diligence reports is we run a background check on that individual. Uh, and then we dig into, we have our little open source intelligence team that digs into social media. I was just getting so, ready to say in today's world, you need to look back social media, not just two or three months, six months. You need to look back as long as you, as far as you can because, and for multiple accounts and stuff like that. So it's, yeah. Yeah. So, you know, social media, you can, you can build out a chart of connections of who they're connected to, who they talk to constantly and it paints uh, a really, really good picture. So if you aren't on social media, Hey, Maybe good thing on you. Uh, if you are on social media, watch what you post. You know, uh, yep. prior to this job, I was probably more apt to, to throw out certain opinions. Um, not that I was ever on social media that much, mainly because of my background in the military, it really frowned upon and, and you didn't want your information out there. I use it more as a connection with friends and family. Again, I'm on the East Coast, grew up on the West Coast. Um, and I help out with different charity organizations. So it's my way of connecting with people, but just before you hit that submit button, think about what you're going to post because employers are looking at that today. Uh, Absolutely. and it paints a good, pretty good picture. You know, is this person a volatile person that, you know, is he a left wing, right wing, whatever, is he a maniac? Um, is he going to spout something off and cause tension in the workplace, you know, or does, Hey, does he just get along to get along like we all should, you know, and appreciate everyone's differences of opinion. So, uh, social media is a great tool that we use constantly um, in our background checks. Uh, we call them due diligence because we do a little bit more than a background check. We, like I said, we jump into that social media realm uh, quite heavily. Yep. And so uh, I know talking about due diligence, when I bought my house, I looked in the area, a buddy of mine lives in this area too. And he unfortunately didn't do his due diligence and he was in a high flood area and his house has been flooded a few times now because of hurricanes. Before I moved down here, I, I talked to a friend of mine who was in the Army Corps of Engineers and he gave me the, which you can check, you know, you can get that information public anyways. But he actually, you know, he hooked me up and let me know and said, hey, you're in a, one of the best areas as far as flood zones and hurricanes because of your sea level. He's like, even though you're right next to the ocean, you're in a good area. And that's one of the main reasons we purchased this land as opposed to a couple other lots we were looking at. Great point, right? Yeah. Uh... I mentioned security assessments that we do. Uh, we do look at the threat of natural disasters. You know, whether you are in a flood zone due to hurricane and flooding, if you're by a river or a stream, uh, high ground versus low ground, earthquakes, tornadoes, uh, that is, those are great tools. You know, you can go to the Geological Society, uh, USGA, no, that's a golf. Um, you can go uh, Geological Society, uh, Google it, and they'll tell you earthquakes. USGS. And they, USGS, thank you. Uh, obviously, didn't pay a school uh, enough attention <laughs> in school there. Uh, however, uh, USGS, and you can find out how often there are earthquakes. You know, they report them literally every time, wherever they have a seismic sensor all over the world. It's actually really, really interesting um, seeing how many earthquakes are happening on a daily basis. Same with flood zones. You can uh, go to the government websites and you can find out what flood zone you are. And you can actually place your address and it'll tell you, it'll actually show up with a diagram, multiple different diagrams, and show you how much of a risk you are in that flood zone. So again, it's just, it's doing that, that homework and experience too. Experience is part, in my opinion, part of due diligence. Uh, when I first bought my house, I bought, uh, again, in this tiny little town that I live in, pretty quiet, but there's a double yellow. Um, didn't think anything of it. I was a single guy at the time and uh, didn't think, you know, went out there a few times, but didn't go during, you know, school, drop off, pick up, business hours. Uh, and the traffic was nuts. It was a 25, but everyone was doing 35 or 45. So it when my wife was pregnant with our first son, I was like, we're out of here. Or, you know, put the house up for sale. I never would have bought a house had I known 
you know, don't ever buy on a double yellow, you know, unless you yeah. want some traffic, at least in my area. So you know, just little tips, you know, every time you deal with a real estate agent, you're learning new things. Every time you do something in life, you're, you're learning new things, put those in your backpack, you know, and when you come across that experience, it's, it's that due diligence that, that you're referring to and that you're, you're trying to use. So, um, again, any, everyone does due diligence. They just don't know, realize that they're doing their homework, you know, even when you buy a car, you're looking at loans, you're looking at uh, reviews, whether it's car and driver, consumer reports, and, and you're, you know, there's different blog sites. So um, if you kind of think of it in those terms of something that an asset that you're going to buy and you're going to invest tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands, sometimes millions of dollars, look at that uh, and think of it as buying a car or buying a house, you know. You're not going to marry the first chick you date, the first guy you date, right? Well, you know, you, you might, you may, you're not going to do it on their first date unless you're in Vegas. Yeah. Uh, um, or, so or, it's, or Fort Benning or Fort Bragg. So Fort Bragg. Uh, if you're in the 82nd, Question you know, you're, you're, 18, you're 18 and you don't like living in the barracks, then, then you just might. Uh, but most people uh, don't, they usually, you know, the reason why you're dating is because you're, you're kind of doing your due diligence. You know, you're, you're finding out about the person. Are you compatible? Yeah. So, uh, so going back to the natural disasters and stuff like that, when it occurs is not the time to do your due diligence. You got to make sure you do it ahead of time. So we're getting into hurricane season right now. You should have already had your evacuation routes planned out. You know, what's going to happen if it's coming here, I need to go here. If it's coming, if it's making an approach from the East, I'm going here. If it's making an approach from the South, I'm going there. The routes, where I'm going, what I'm doing. If you're a business, you know, you got to make sure you have your insurance in, in order. And that's all due diligence. This stuff with all these riots or protests that turn into riots, stuff like that. It's a good time if you're not affected to go ahead and call your insurance companies, find out what's what you're covered for and what if what, if anything, you can do to help protect yourself better, call these security companies and say, hey, listen, if this comes to our town, what do I need to do to get you out here? What can I do to have you come protect me? How much is it going to cost? What kind of uh, advance notice? What kind of coverage am I going to get for X amount of price? Absolutely. Like you literally just hit it on, you know, hit something I'm working on right now with a client of ours. We're looking at uh, business travel and accidental insurance. Um they have a current carrier that they've had for years. Uh, they've always just renewed it every single year, even though every year, you know, if you look at business travel ins insurance, and we could do another podcast on this because there's so much information on this. Uh, but most employees have, you know, medical insurance. They have workman's comp insurance. And then these larger companies that do a lot of international stuff, they have business travel insurance. Uh, and there's a handful of, of companies out there. You have your AIGs, you have your Chubbs, you have multiple other insurance companies that, that cover uh, BTA insurance. However, this company, they didn't do their due diligence every single year on them. They had bad internally, even with each other. They just they had kept having these bad experiences and they want to know why this insurance company, every time they had needed an employee to be evacuated, whether it was medical or security reasons, to be uh, evacuated out of this con a country, it didn't matter what, whether it was Europe or Asia, there's always getting stonewalled by their mm -hmm. business travel, accidental insurance company and it what i'm starting to peel the onion back right uh i've been working on it for a few weeks peeling the onion back it's because the company that they have there they have there's another action arm so you have your road aware your international sos your aig travel guard uh numerous other companies that will go in they you know large large companies multi-million dollar companies that will go in and they'll do your medical they'll do your security assessments uh and your evacuations and medical evacuations and if it's you stub your toe, you need a stitch. Hey, you, you call them up, call up their 1-800 number. And here's a, a hospital in downtown Lima, Peru, that we recommend that they've already vetted for you. This company didn't do that. Uh, they they went with this one insurance provider and they thought that they were getting this action arm, but they weren't. Mm -hmm. And so every time that incident happened, constant issues and issues and issues. And it wasn't until he peeled the onion back, well, you know what? You, it's included, but if you want all this extra stuff, you have to pay for it. And so now I'm helping them out with, hey, you know, based on your company and what you need and their global size and amount of travelers and what you're looking for, this is a type of business travel 
accidental insurance that you want to go with. And these are the companies that you want to go with as far as your action arms. Mm -hmm. So whether it's your road aware, international SOS, all your other companies out there, um, arrow care, uh, red point who can, who can do, uh, that type of action that you need. So again, uh, for a large company doing that due diligence, knowing what you're paying for. I mean, these insurance policies are hundreds of thousands of dollars a year. Um, Normally, they're not used all that much and included in that business travel, accidental is dismemberment, you know, all this other stuff that your medical and workman's comp doesn't cover. Uh, but do you, on your insurance companies, even if it's your homeowner's insurance company or your car insurance company, do your due diligence on them, you know? And due diligence doesn't stop once you've purchased it. You need to continue doing it. And that's something that was, that's a hard lesson I just learned. Recently, we sold our, I had a rental house that I sold a couple months ago. And I was going through my insurance stuff like I do every two or three months. And I was still paying for renter's insurance on a house that I hadn't owned in three months. I'm like, why am I still paying for this? So I had to call up and do that. And if I had been more up on my due diligence, I wouldn't have paid the last three months. And it's not a lot, but it's still money, you know? So, and just like this guy, this company, they're paying for years and years and years and not getting the service that they want. And you come to find out that it was included, but not unless you paid more. Yeah. I mean, you can break this down to your average Joe, right? Uh, you know, my homeowner's insurance, you can call different restoration companies after a home has been flooded or a fire or anything's been affected to it that your insurance companies usually go through to, rebuild your house or anything else that needs to be fixed and ask them, Hey, what insurance company do you recommend and why? Yep. And they'll say, Hey, you know, I recommend this company because they're easier to deal with. They're, you know, they give you X amount of dollars up front. You don't have to fight with them. Blah, 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 blah. It's same with your car insurance company. When you, when you total your car, it's not the time. It's just like, man, I wish I would have gone with X company over Y company because yeah, Y company was cheaper. And you get what you pay for, or you could pay for X company that's super expensive and not get anything you pay for. So, you know, talk to body shops and other companies that are in that field that are constantly dealing with these companies and, and ask them, you know, just as the average guy, average person, uh, what, you know, what they recommend uh, for your personal stuff as well. So I think so we're kind of beat up. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. So I was going to say, essentially, it boils down to that. If you're not doing your due diligence, you're not doing your homework, right? So, you know, we all have kids and we we get on them if they're not doing their homework, even though we weren't the best students that we admitted to previously. So I'm definitely not going to let my kids listen to this podcast. But, you know, we make sure that they're doing their homework because we don't want them to be, we want them to do better than us, right? That's what you know, every parent wants for their kids is for them to do better than what we did for ourselves. So I want my, my daughter wants to go to medical school. So I'm on her all the time about, hey, you got to do your homework. You got to get all this stuff in. You can't afford to slip one inch. And, and it's essentially, if you're not doing your dual deal inches, you're not doing your homework. Exactly. So think about your book reports, right? Like I, I was horrible at them. I procrastinated up to the last minute. Uh, procrastination on your due diligence and in business and in security doesn't usually pan out well for you. So uh, great episode this week. Um, again, count how many times I said, you know, uh, we'll send you something. Uh, Will, let them know where uh, they can find us and where to shoot us the message at. All right. So you can follow us on uh, www.coffeesquadpodcast.com. That'll take us to, or that'll take you to our podcast website. And we have 15, maybe 16 sites now. We just got the approval for Pandora. I'm just waiting for the final thing to go through. Uh, and you can listen to us on Pandora, hopefully within the next week. And then also you can go to facebook.com and search coffee squad podcast. And that's where you can go ahead and comment, talk about Jake and his foo-foo water or me and my pinkies up coffee. And you know, where in the world, you know, that game, where's Waldo, we can play where's Ray at this week. I think he's in Japan doing karaoke tour. So he obviously did do his due diligence. <laughs> no, he didn't. Mm -mm. So yeah. And you know, don't forget to like subscribe, share with your friends. We appreciate the support. Yeah, absolutely. A big shout out to our ASIS members who are starting to follow us. Thank you. Again, shoot us comments, critiques, uh, what you would like us to talk about. Security is a pretty fascinating, pretty fun topic. We enjoy it. Uh, so, again, share those likes and let us know how we can improve. Have a great week. Thank you. Thanks. Have a good one.